as we all know, uh, we've got an amazing lineup this weekend, and I, for one, can't wait to sit down and listen to all of the amazing speakers. But as we kick off, we need to hear from our president of American Atheists, David Silverman. Uh, David, please come on up. So yes, David. Um, David's a great guy, and uh, get me a couple drinks, and I'll talk about how great a guy he is. Um, one of the reasons why we are here in Utah is to normalize who we are. We are your loved ones. We are your friends. We are everybody you meet. We're the people on the street. Wait a minute, that's Sesame Street, right? Yeah, we are the atheists are the people in your neighborhood. Okay. Um, and nobody better to do that than you because you are lovable, you are memeable, and you are my friend. Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mila. Good morning, everybody. Woo! I was going to come out and say, let's get this party started, but the rumor has it that the party started last night at the bar and then migrated up to the 11th floor. So that's great. I would like to start out by wishing you all a heartfelt, wonderful Good Friday. <laughs> it is going to be a Good Friday. We have fantastic speakers, and uh, today I'm going to give you my presentation. Can we go to the slides, please? I have lipstick on my face. It's staying. All right. This side? All right. Uh, well. That's okay. I don't want a lipstick on my face. How many people got the It's not a good thing. All right, so my speech today is called Seeds of Doubt. I'm premiering it at this convention, and, and really this speech is, is designed to give you an idea of what we're doing. And I wanted to make this speech about everything that we're doing, and I utterly failed. There's just no way. So what you're going to see is I'm going to talk about some of the things we're doing, and then I'm going to run out of time. And then later on, Eric Husby is going to come on and talk, and then he's going to run out of time. And then uh, uh, Amanda Kanief is going to come up, and guess what she's going to do? She's going to run out of time. So I'm just going to start right in and talk about Seeds of Doubt and give, us our, and give you our agenda. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is the housekeeping, the other stuff. This is the stuff that I wanted to talk about that really doesn't fit in with the plan of the speech. So that's kind of important stuff that I want to get to, but that's not going to happen. Then, I'm going to start into the presentation itself, seeds of doubt. A doubt about what? And where is this doubt going? What is the evidence for the growth that we are seeing? And is atheism on a hockey stick? Yes. And then, uh, we're going to go into the long-term strategy of American atheists, going where we are not, the benches that everybody is talking about. I'm going to talk about CPAC because it was fun. <laughs> Uh, then I'm going to talk about the other side. I talked about the conservatives. I'm going to talk about the progressives. Make two very important announcements. And then I'm going to talk about what will happen and, most importantly, what can get in our way. Now, before I go into all that stuff, I'm going to go into the housekeeping part. Now, this is very important to me. First things first. I love first things first. Ladies and gentlemen, please raise your hand if this is your first atheist convention ever. Ah. So to those of you who are new, first of all, let's do the other side. Please raise your hand if you've been in this movement for more than 15 years. Yeah. So to those of you who are new, I really urge you to socialize as much as you can and meet the people around you. I still remember very vividly the first time that I walked into a room filled with atheists. It was a room much smaller than this. But I still love that feeling of walking into a room full of atheists. And you know what? It still sticks with me. And I fell in love with the movement, not because of the issues, but because of the people. Please, folks, socialize. Get to meet your fellow atheists. If this is your first event, you're going to have a great time at this event. This event is designed for you. Uh, next thing, I want to talk again about what I'm not going to talk about. 
a lot of people are interested in what is going on with the TD Bank. Uh, of, of course, some of you may know that we were refused uh, notary services at a TD Bank because we were atheists. Um, Amanda's going to talk about that. And I am not going to talk about legal issues during this talk. For those of you who are interested in our lawsuits, you need to wait until Eric Husby, he's speaking tomorrow, and he's going to talk, about, talk all about that. Uh, we lost some people this year. It's been a hard year. Uh, we lost three people. Uh, uh, we lost Noel, we lost Edwin, and we lost Rich. And uh, it's not on the schedule, but there is a memorial tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. right here for our three uh, fallen uh, friends. Um, here's an interesting announcement. I get a lot of this, I get a lot of questions about my book. So here's what happened with my book. Uh, I was approached by a publisher. He said, write a book. And I wrote a book. And I wrote this great tome in the book. And this tome specifically said, uh, was talking about how atheists do not have to obey religious laws that if a religious person comes to you and says, hey, it's against my religion for you to do that, you still can do that. It's OK. And in fact, he is kind of being a butthead for telling you that you have to respond to his laws. So I wrote this great tome, and at the bottom of it, I put a smiley face, and I labeled the smiley face the Prophet Muhammad of Islam. <laughs> and I lost my publishing contract. The good news is my book has been picked up and uh, it, it will not be called I Atheist. That was one of the conditions. They don't like I Atheist. So it's going to be called, so right now it is now officially titled the book formerly known as I Atheist. <laughs> and it will be out in 2015. If anyone wants to know anything about the book, just follow my Twitter. Believe me, I will keep you informed. Um, and I want to ask you just uh, briefly to meet the movement. This is a very important point. This is a movement event. Yes, it's sponsored by American atheists, but I am all about the movement, and there are a lot of representatives here from the movement. Uh, Ron Lindsay, uh, executive director of CFI, is here. Amanda Meskis, executive director of Camp Quest, is here. Sarah Moorhead, executive director of Recovering from Religion, is here. They're all here, and I invite you to talk to them. I invite you to meet them. Also, Dan Ellis. For those of you who are local, please talk to Dan. Atheists of Utah is a very is a thriving group. They need growth. They need membership. The objective of one of the objectives of bringing the American Atheist Convention here was to grow atheists of Utah so that when we leave, we leave behind a thriving atheist community. Please make sure, if you're local, to find Dan, talk to Dan, and join Atheists of Utah. And while I'm at it, let's talk about the vendors. We have 33 vendors here. 33. Somebody asked me about my shoes. I'm so glad you asked. They're atheist shoes. Now, when we started, when I, when I for, for forever, I've been worried about making an atheist economy. We have to create and, def, and, and, and nurture an atheist economy. Atheists buying atheist stuff from atheists. This is important. This is how we grow as a community. It used to be that we would have two or three vendors. We have 33 here because we're succeeding. We've got, I've got in my pocket a, a, a what the fuck face pendant. <laughs> this is important stuff. This is important stuff. And lastly, before I get into the presentation, I want to take a moment to thank all the staff and all the volunteers. Yeah. You know what? If, if you registered and everything went smoothly, that's because of the staff and the volunteers that are helping us out. It's a great organization. And when I say it's a great organization, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the staff of American Atheists. We're a very lean group. We've got five full-time employees, three part-time employees. And we've got a ton of volunteers, including uh, Ken Lukinen and Greg Lammers, who are running our national level offices. Uh, so thank you all for listening to the housekeeping. 
Let's get into Seeds of Doubt. Why sow seeds? What are we doing? This is really the why are we doing this. And when we talk about sowing seeds of doubt, we have to talk about the who benefits. And the first group of people who are benefiting from see, sowing seeds of doubt, and when I'm talking about sowing seeds of doubt, I'm talking about being an atheist and being an out atheist and, and pushing the atheist envelope just a little bit. For them, for the theists. Pushing atheism for the theists. I'm going to start off this presentation with, frankly, my most controversial point. We have to have a realization that religion is a lie. Yes, of course, we know that. And believers are victims of the lie who need help. Believers are victims of the lie who need help. If you agree with that statement, if you agree with the Christopher Hitchens uh, statement that religion is a poison, we have to address the concept that pushing atheism is a good deed. We have to go there. And I know it feels wrong because I know that pushing atheism and that, 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 that actively, for lack of a better word, proselytizing atheism feels wrong because it feels like religion. But just because the religious people do it doesn't mean it's wrong. They have smart people working for them. And if religion is a lie, and those of you who have recovered from religion can understand how much better you feel now that you're out, well, we have to take for granted, well, we have to at least take under consideration the fact that preaching atheism and talking atheism and pushing atheism is not only uh, a good thing to do, it is a good deed to do for the people listening, whether they like to hear it or not. <laughs> Having said that, we also have to talk about sowing seeds for us. Legalized forced compliance to religious laws is everywhere, and we're done with that. I think we should all be done with that. You know, one nation under God, my butt. Uh, in God we trust. Thou shalt not draw Muhammad. Right. I draw Muhammad, thank you very much. But blasphemy laws are real. Blasphemy laws are real, and there are people in this country, Mariam Namazi is going to be talking about this later, but there are people in this country that are pushing blasphemy laws. There are people in Western Europe that are under blasphemy laws right now. This is something that we have the obligation to ourselves to fight tooth and nail. Restrictions on abortion and bodily autonomy, autonomy death with dignity, LGBT equality. These are primarily separation of church and state issues. They have to be recognized as such. They are attempts by religious people to force their morality on everyone else. We must fight that. It is our job to fight that. And of course, the unfair tax breaks. American atheists, yeah. The, the, you know what? American atheists is suing the IRS. I don't know if all of you know this, but we are suing the IRS. Eric is going to be talking about this to get rid of the unfair tax breaks for churches and religious institutions in the tax code. It is a great suit, and we will win. Beyond for them, beyond for us, we need to sow seeds for this country. And yes, I know some people are against my occasional patriotism talk, but I'm a patriot. I like America. I think it's a good place. And I think religion is the enemy of the great American melting pot because religion abhors diversity. For those of you who were in the Mormon discussion just a few days ago, they said, the, the, my, our Mormon counterpart said, oh look, we're inclusive, we're very inclusive, we accept anybody who wants to come to us. That's not inclusive, okay? You're welcome to be like me is not inclusive, but it's what they call inclusive. You're welcome to stay as you are. That's inclusive, okay? But religion promotes intolerance and ignorance, rather, nationwide to protect its myths from facts. Religion hates to be proven wrong. Religion is the enemy of science. Science is not the enemy of religion. 
But religion is the enemy of science because science keeps proving religion wrong over and over and over again. So what do they do? They try and stymie science. They don't change and say, well, yeah, you're right. Uh, the world is not the center of the universe. You got us there. They won't say that. They'll say, stop teaching that. That makes ignorant kids. And those kids are going to compete on a global, on a global market for jobs against people who know what science is. And they're not going to get those jobs. So it is our job, it is our ethical responsibility to help our country go beyond the religion so that we can concentrate on science and grow a generation of kids who know what science is and are proud to know what science is. And finally, religion demonizes outgroups. Again, back to the Mormons. You can be like us if you want. Anybody can be like us. That is the demonization of outgroups. You can't go to a Mormon temple to, to, to see your family member get married if you're not Mormon. That's because you're an outgroup. And now think about that on an extreme level, because that's what we have in this country is an extreme level. And so we've got this little graphic there, which is supposed to be a melting pot, or that's what came up with a melting pot, but really it's a stew, right? with everybody is individual and separate. And this is not the American ideal. The American ideal is not a cell of Muslims, a cell of Jews, a cell of Christians, and a cell of atheists. The, the American ideal is all of us living together, working toward a common goal as equals. This is not complicated. This is what we are supposed to be, and this is what we need to drive. And this is one of the many reasons that we need to defeat religion dead. I want to talk a little bit about how the movement is expanding. And I want to show it to you because uh, th there's a bunch of different ways that I'm going to show it to you. The first way I'm going to show it to you is with the Reason Rally. Now, was anybody at the Reason Rally? That was fun, huh? Now, for those of you who weren't there, the Reason Rally was the largest atheist event in world history. Now, what you see here, what you see here is 2,500 people in, in Washington, D.C. 2,500 people in Washington, D.C. at what was the largest atheist event in world history in 2002 at the Godless Americans March on Washington. That's the before picture. That's the after picture. This is what we're seeing. Now, this is 30,000 people, 30,000 people in the rain. You see the skies and the difference in the skies? The top picture is a nice pretty blue sky. We didn't have that at the Reason Rally. It was cold and wet and rainy and people were wearing ponchos and they smiled the whole time. 30,000 people in the rain. And this is still just the beginning of the growth that we're seeing. Let's look at other things that are g giving us some ideas on how fast we're growing. Oh, look, there's God. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about soft stuff, and then I'll get into my friends, the numbers. I like numbers. Atheists like numbers. But let's start with the qualitative stuff first. One of the things that you can see is the atheist groups popping up over the past five years on the national level. Uh, Hispanic American freethinkers, David Tamayo is here. Uh, uh, black Atheists of America, Black Non-Believers, Mandisa is here, Recovering from Religion, uh, Sarah is here. Uh, there's so much growth in groups, and that's a symptom, right? It's not that we're making atheists, it's that we're supporting the growth of atheists. Local, social, and activist groups are growing up everywhere. In just about every city now in this country, every major city, something atheist is happening. In every city, even in the Bible Belt, there are meetups, there are drinking with skeptics, humanist communities, growing, 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 student groups. August Brunsman from the SSA is not here, unfortunately, today, but they're growing like crazy, adding affiliate after affiliate after affiliate. They're not making atheists. They're satisfying the need 
of the explosion of atheists that is happening around us. This is what we're seeing on a national level. The TV and the press is also something to be considered because one of the things that we need to remember when the TV and the press is that it is reflective. It is not activistic. It shows us uh, what it thinks will sell. So when we see TV characters as atheists, that's a plus. They're not making news by doing that. They're courting us. They're courting us. They're poking fun at religion because they're courting us at the expense of religion. Yeah, CNN and Washington Post have regular bloggers. Religion News Service has an atheist reporter. Religion News Service has an atheist reporter. And just last week, the Salt Lake Tribune announced that it is dumping the faith section of their newspaper. Wait a This is the kind of growth that we're seeing. This is the kind of uh, explosion that we're seeing. Poll after poll. Atheism is growing while religion is shrinking. Poll after poll. And now we get to numbers. I like numbers. So is atheism on a hockey stick? Well, for those of you who don't understand my term, hockey stick is when something goes, starts like this and goes like this. And so the first thing I want to do is show you something that doesn't look like a hockey stick, which is that. This is from a Gallup poll of 2012 that shows the growth of nuns is still increasing but on a lessening rate. Now, before I get into the numbers, let me just say this. I am fully aware that not all nuns are atheists, but they're a heck of a lot closer to us than they are to everyone else. And one thing that we don't take care of, when people say, well, not all nuns are atheists, they don't consider the fact that a ton of atheists call themselves Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Okay? So I'm going to talk about nuns because that's us. And I'm just going to use that as an example. Now, when this chart came out, when this poll came out, the news was all over it because the first thing you see is that the growth of atheism, the growth of the nuns, is decreasing. It's still growing but to a lesser extent. And the headlines were, were great, you know? The growth of nuns is leveling off. The age of atheism is over. So maybe we should just go home. Or we can take a moment to look at the numbers one level deeper. Percent. Let's take a look at the numbers one level deeper. It's the same poll. It's the same timeline. But what are we seeing here? Well, the first thing you're going to see, I hope you can see this, is that this is, uh, these lines are the, av the, the, uh, the, the green line on the, on the middle. Bleh. The green line in the middle is the upper chart, OK? And we separate it out by age. We see the known stereotype that the younger you are, the less religious you are. We can see what's going on here. The 30 to 39s had a huge uptick. The 18 to 29s reached 32%. And everybody who's below the average is old. <laughs> so, and yeah, I'm going to use those languages, OK? But what's going to happen here? Look at this chart and just, look, just think about it. What's going to happen in 20 years? What is going to happen when the 65s, I'll say it, die? And when the 55s, I'll say it, die? What's going to happen to that average? Ladies and gentlemen, we are looking at a huge uptick. Bruce, screen. Bruce, thank you. <laughs> we are looking at a huge uptick over the next 20 years that is inescapable. It is inescapable. We are on the very precipice of a hockey stick. Within just a few, uh, just a couple of decades, we are going to double in size. We are going to be 30% of this population. This does not even include the fact that the younger folks are growing, that those clives are coming up. 
This is not even including the fact that there are more people coming in, and they're going to be less religious too, because guess what? The 30 to 39s and the 18 to 29s, they're breeding. <laughs> so is atheism on a hockey stick? Oh, yeah, it's on a hockey stick. So while they're telling us, you guys got to go home, we are not going home. We have things to do. Now, religion is going to do everything that it can to stop this trend. Religion does not want this to happen. They do not want to see us in the 20 and 30 percent range. They do not want to see that at all. So they are lying. They are saying we're not, we don't exist. They are trying to divide us and say, well, there's only a few percent that call yourselves atheists. And they completely ignore the atheists who call themselves agnostics, the atheists who call themselves secular humanists, and the atheists who call themselves secular none or secular other. These are all atheists, and it brings us nice and up. But the fact is that they will do whatever they can to minimize the trend that is unavoidably true. Revisionist history, fake science. Did you know that there's a geocentric movie out there where they quote mind uh, uh, Lawrence Krauss? and they made it sound like he was a geocentrist. They will lie, and they will put out these propaganda movies, like Noah, oh geez, guess what? The big problem with Noah was that wasn't biblically accurate enough. <laughs> this is what we're dealing with, and so, this is the big point. Given the fact, given these two charts, and given that religion is doing everything to stop us, we have our long-term strategy. Our long-term strategy is to simply outlast religion. And we're going to do it by establishing and maintaining a presence in every possible place. We are going to sow our doubt for the basics, just the basics. We don't have to get complicated. But we're going to sow our doubt everywhere. But doubt about what? Doubt about what? Well, the first thing that we're going to talk about is the veracity of religion. How true is this? We're going to talk about this. How true is religion? Well, of course religion is flawed. And anybody in this room can point out flaw after flaw after flaw of any religion that we pick. You know, the omniscient, the omniscient all-powerful God who lets bad things happen to good people. You know, this is basic stuff and we can point it out and there are lots of silver bullets that we can use. One religion is no more valid than the other. Oh, your Jesus is more real than the blue God with the many arms? Well, there's a billion people that disagree. Well, guess what? You're just one of many. And they are only members, and this is a real powerful point, gets them to stutter, the fact that they're only members of the church that they're in because they were born there. That's a real powerful point. And we need to drive that home. We need to drive that home. These are three simple points. We don't have to get into very much detail. These are three real easily, really easily pushable points as we move forward in this thing, as we move forward through this time frame. We're also going to sow doubts about the ubiquity of their religion and the presence of atheists. Isn't Salt Lake City a Mormon city? Doesn't everyone believe something? Isn't religion necessary? No! And we need to make those points because Salt Lake City is not a Mormon city. It is an American city full of a very diverse American population, including a very good atheist organization and a very thriving population. And the last thing we want to sow doubts about is the privilege that they think their religion deserves. What if God wants me to break an American law? Ask people that. What if God wants you to make a break in American law? And who tells you that? It's a great question to ask any and every politician. Any and every politician. What law comes first? Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution says, among other things, that the Constitution itself is the supreme law of the land. Do they agree? We need to know. We need to know. Uh, what, we are a Christian nation. How many people have heard, we are a Christian nation? Yeah. And the, a lot of people say, we are a Christian nation, period. But really, what we should be doing is pushing, we are a Christian nation, comma, so. Because there's a positive, that, that's an, a, a response to something. And what it is, is a response to privilege. We deserve to be able to break this law because we're a Christian nation. 
We are a Christian nation, so we're more special than you. We are a Christian nation, so we deserve more stuff than you. We are a Christian nation, so we deserve more privilege than you. And then, as soon as you bring out the privilege and the special rights, you bring back the golden rule. Oh, so you don't support the golden rule. Because if you were the minority, would you want us to have special rights? Would you want, in God, we do not trust on the money? I don't think you would. I mean, I just heard today that the, the president of uh, the Mormon temple came out and said that religious freedom is under attack. <laughs> this is privilege speaking. Religious freedom is under attack. No, religious privilege is under attack. We are demanding equality. <laughs> and speaking about religious privilege, we are taking atheism where we aren't. And that's what I want to talk about with this. Atheist monuments. Now, for those of you who don't know, American Atheists put the first ever atheist monument in a public square this past year. They had a big Ten Commandments monument. You can see it in the picture. They had a big Ten Commandments monument, 12 feet tall. And it was there for a reason, right? It was there to push privilege. So we brought in these benches uh, as a compatible. So we created the first monument on, in public square. What does it do? It exists to attack the veracity and the ubiquity and privilege in one fell swoop, right? It counters religious arguments in the text on the monument. It counters the ubiquity. It reminds people that this is not a Christian city. This is a diverse city and atheists are here. And it accounts the privilege. Now the privilege is important. The privilege is very important because the Ten Commandments were put there. Why? Because we're a Christian nation and we deserve our big 12-foot monument on the public land. But we're not. And so we used the First and the Fourteenth Amendment to sue and succeed. And the thing about it is, these are slam dunk cases. You can't do it. You can't put this in there. So we go into these cities, and we're doing this multiple times now, where there are existing Ten Commandments monuments and insisting on putting up an atheist monument. Now some people say, hey, you know what, there's really, uh, why are we putting up atheist monuments? It just makes us look like them. It just makes us look like religion. You, you have to understand the point here. When you have a Ten Commandments monument in a public square alone, it conveys a clear message of endorsement of Christianity. When you take that same mall, that same area, and you put in an atheist monument too, the message completely changes from one that specifically endorses Christianity to one that specifically does not endorse Christianity. It is worse for the religious right to have a place that specifically endorses pluralism, that specifically endorses the fact that Christianity does not deserve a privilege. Why is that important? Because it reduces the incentive to put more monuments up. We don't want the monuments up. We don't want benches everywhere. And when those Ten Commandments monuments come down, our monuments come down. No problem. No questions asked. But these are, uh, but this is not going to be something that is taken lightly because they're virtually unlosable cases. And I like virtually unlosable cases. <laughs> and and, and the, the three words to remember, normalize, normalize, normalize. We're bringing atheism to the public square. Wherever there's religion, we will bring in atheism to counter it and to negate the perceived privilege and the perceived endorsement of Christianity in the public square. Now, so, another place that we're going that we're not, guess where? Fox News. I gotta love me some Fox News, folks. You know, no matter what you say, Gretchen Carlson, she's done well by us, she's done well by me. We've got too many appearances to mention at this point. In fact, I think I am the first atheist in the country with a regular appearance on a talk show to present the atheist viewpoint and that as an equal to Christians and Jews. <laughs> and
And that's important because it injects the atheism into the lives of Fox viewers. What is it doing? Negating the ubiquity, negating the privilege. This is not a religious station, not all the time. Sometimes the atheists get in and sometimes we have a say. Sometimes we have some points to make. But again, just like the growth that we've seen in atheist groups, just like the growth we've seen in press, this is a symptom, not a cause. I like Gretchen. She's not doing this for me. She's doing this for her and for her show. And she's doing it for her and for her show because she and her producers think that adding the atheist brings in viewers and raises their points. They know we're growing. They don't like it, but as we go on, as atheism continues to explode, we're going to see a lot more atheism where it doesn't supposedly belong on Fox News. <laughs> Speaking of atheism where it doesn't quite belong, there's CPAC. <laughs> now, this is a great picture, and you can't quite tell what's happening in this picture. So picture a great big ballroom filled with conservatives, and they're all letting out. You see those people in the back? They're all letting out, and they're all coming down this hallway, and I'm sitting in there in the front of the hallway wearing my firebrand atheist shirt adorned with pins holding atheist literature ready to hand it out. It was a... <laughs> It was, a, it was a little bit scary, I will tell you. <laughs> at first, it was a little bit scary. It was the first atheist presence of its kind at this event. Nobody had heard from us. Nobody had uh, seen from us. We were originally there to have a table, but then they found out we were coming, and they complained. And then they made up a reason, a lie, to take our table away. They said we were attacking theists when we attacked religion. No. We don't attack people, we attack religion, because religion deserves to be attacked. Very simple. But we were the first ones there, and we spread the word at CPAC over and over again. No, conservatism is not just for Christians. And atheist fiscal conservatives, by the millions, are being pushed away by the theocrats who are trying to agree conservative politics with Christianity. You know what, folks? There's a lot of conservatives who are not Christian right. There's a lot of conservatives who are not Christian right. And what we saw was really uh, a, an interesting experience. We went in there specifically to divorce Christianity from politics at the ground level. And I think we made some serious headway because guess who I met at CPAC? A lot of atheists. A lot of atheists. And Ted Cruz had just come out and said, Jesus wrote the Constitution. <laughs> and you look at the atheist conservatives and you say, doesn't that make you look like an idiot when you put yourself in their camp? And they nodded. They agreed. We're sowing that seed. We're pushing that. And the other interesting thing, guess what else I met? A lot of Christians who liked us, who thought we should be part of the equation who thought bringing in atheists into conservatism and, stop, and, and the cessation of forcing us away might benefit conservatives. They agree, by and large. The conservatives who attended CPAC are very different from the conservatives who run CPAC. Very different. What does that mean? Well, that means that we are there with a very fertile ground to unseat, to unseat Christianity from conservatism. It's a big, big goal. But if we are successful in that, we win. We win. If there's no Christianity and conservatism, our problems are over. Right? We go away. So there will be more conservative events in our future. Uh, because by and large, there's so many people there, there's so much room for growth that I can't resist. I just can't resist. So we will be going to more conservative events in the future, 
and we'll also be attending the progressive events. We wouldn't, of course, want to leave the progressive events alone. So we weren't where we were as well in the progressive tone, in, in the progressive conventions. Now, a lot of times in the past, American atheists have been tabling mainly at other atheist events. That's fine. But it's cannibalizing, right? It's just, it, it, it's low-hanging fruit and it doesn't grow the pie. It doesn't expand the movement. So we decided to expand the movement. So we went to Netroots Nation, where we had the first atheist table at that progressive uh, high-tech event. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I personally was very popular at Netroots Nation. People knew who I was. People asked for my autograph and my picture. They like us, and they were thrilled to see us. They were also thrilled to see us at creating change, where we were the first atheist, atheist in quotes, presence at, Ameri at creating change. We were the first atheist table at the NOW convention, and we're going back to NOW. We were the first, we will be the first atheist presence at the American Constitution Society, because we have to be out there. There's so much low-hanging fruit when we're talking about the amount of atheists in the progressive movement who want to be involved but don't know the atheist movement exists. That is going away. And we are introducing the entire atheist movement to the progressives and to the conservatives. Other atheist organizations are following in our footsteps, increasing our movement's visibility on this fertile, fertile ground. And I'm very proud to have been the organization that led the way in that place. Now, several years ago, I attended a pajama party. A pajama party at an atheist event. And I was sitting on the floor in this pajama party, just hanging out with some friends, and a discussion came up about television. We need an atheist television station, they said. <laughs> so we're making an atheist television station. <laughs> Coming soon to seven million television sets worldwide, atheist television is coming up on the Roku, state, on the Roku network. It is going to be the first ever atheist television channel that you can see on a TV like a regular person. You will be able to view atheist programming 24-7 on your television, on your phone, on your tablet. It will be live streaming and it will include video on demand so you can watch whatever thing you want, including last 2012's Reason Rally or the Atheist Viewpoint or any other shows from any other organization. We are opening this up to the entire movement as equals. That's our theme. Other orgs, bloggers, vloggers, if you've got content and it's good quality, we want you on Atheist TV where everybody can see you on their regular television network. And for those of you who want to subscribe, it's free, at least for now. <laughs> and we'll be launching that in July, uh, and it's in, actually in beta now, and we'll be launching it in July, and we're very excited to bring this to you, bringing atheism <clears throat> as a channel where it wasn't. And speaking of bringing atheism where it's not, let's talk conventions. Let's talk conventions. Next year, we all know because you've read, your, you've read your pamphlets, the 2015 Atheist Convention will be in the Christian city of Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, there's a lot of Christians in Memphis, Tennessee, but there's a lot of atheists in Memphis, Tennessee. And we're going to go in there just like we're coming into Salt Lake City. And what we will leave behind is a stronger atheist presence in the heartland of the Deep South or the Bible Belt. We'll be staying at the Peabody Hotel. The Peabody Hotel is a beautiful hotel. Now, this picture is not an attractive picture. I'll be the first to admit this on the outside. 
it's not a pretty thing. On the inside, it is a 4.5 star luxury hotel. Cushy, 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 that gave us a fantastic deal. And they want our business so bad, and that's why we're going. Because when we walked in there, they had the Welcome American Atheist sign emblazoned on their wall for us. But that's not the only convention in 2015. Well, that's a, great con that's a great question, Jamila, because what we need to do is break ground. What we need to do is go someplace where we haven't been, not only where American Atheists has not been, but where no atheist organization has been. And you think about it for a second. In what city, where are we talking about where no atheist convention has ever been, where there's so much, where there's so much Christianity that the separation of church and state is a myth? Well, folks, we're going to San Juan. And in San Juan, on August 21st to 23rd, we are going to bring atheism to San Juan in a great, big, fat way. When I announce this to the, to the atheist group, there's a small atheist group in San Juan, and I need you to understand that San Juan and Puerto Rico is... is the violations of separation of church and state are rampant, rampant, and flaunted. They treat themselves, they, they treat themselves like they don't have a constitution. And when I went down there to talk to the atheist group, there were tears coming down their faces when we, when we announced this, this event. I get a little choked up when I think about it. And then what happened? They got so motivated by the fact that we're coming that they sued the city of San Juan. <laughs> they lost, but they were pumped, they were psyched, and they are ready for an atheist convention of proportion to come to the wonderful city of San Juan. And I am really pleased to, be with, to, to bring it to you. This will be the first atheist convention ever in Puerto Rico. It'll be the first primarily Spanish language atheist convention in American history. And it's going to be held at the Sheraton in Old San Juan at the convention center where they have a beautiful infinity pool. I don't know if you can see that pool in the picture, but it is gorgeous. So, so get ready to come to San Juan because it's going to be a lot of fun. So we've got two fantastic conventions scheduled up for you next year, and uh, I am really pleased to bring that to you. I am running out of time, so I'm just going to wrap this up a little bit. Let's talk about what will happen. The last thing I want to talk about is the results. What are we going for here? How are we going to do this? Well, what will happen is atheism is going to be everywhere, folks. Privilege, ubiquity, and veracity of religion will be challenged everywhere. There will be no sanctuary for theism. We will be at Fox News, we will be at CPAC, we will be at every conservative event we can, and we will outlast religion. Because as religion declines and dies out, our overall numbers are going to climb, we're going to climb that hockey stick, and pretty soon we'll be the ones speaking at CPAC. We'll be the ones on Fox News with our own television shows. We're going to be taking this to the next level, and we're going to win this battle because of this kind of strategy. Young people all over will continue to be influenced by education and therefore become more secular, and all this will create a safer place for atheists to be out and proud everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> unless we're stopped. Unless we're stopped. So let's talk about what could stop us. Laws which curtail freedom could stop us, right? Theocratic politicians and theocratic judges could stop us, like this guy here. Uh, and who hobbled, who, <laughs> I mean, the president says every child should go through college. What elitist snobbery. Folks, college isn't elitist. It is education, and it is absolutely necessary for every person. 
because, I mean, think about what they're doing. Think about the insidiousness of this. The less educated you are, the more religious you are. The more likely you are to follow a leader, the more likely you, likely you are to obey orders. This is insidious to attack education. And we must defend our education system against bad information in textbooks, against education is for elitists, or anything like corrupt or inadequate science like geocentrism and intelligent design. What idiocy is that? We're going to fight that tooth and nail. Lies, propaganda, and in the media. Noah, the movie, a true story. <laughs> the geocentric universe. Man, that scares me to see, to see Lawrence Krauss on there. Uh, taken, like, taken out of context like that and, and wordsmith like that. And of course, the History Channel. History Channel, which, which adds, which, which, which airs more about the Bible than it does about, oh, I don't know, history. Uh, but the most important thing that can stop us, the biggest thing that will stop us, and it may stop us, is apathy. People who don't care. Apathy and inactivity, letting the above happen. Oh, it's not going to be a big deal. That's what's going to kill us. That's what's going to take that hockey stick and turn it around. That's what's going to educate our kids about Jesus in the science classroom. Apathy is our enemy. Even worse than religion, apathy is our enemy. And that's why apathy is the one thing that we as an atheist movement need to fight more than anything else. And that's why when you're talking about atheism, you're not just talking about talking atheism to theists, you're talking about talking to atheism to atheists, whether they call themselves Christians or Jews or Muslims or secular humanists or thinkers or, or skeptics or whatever, call themselves atheists. They must be recruited, they must be motivated, and they must be shown that their apathy is hurting this country and hurting this movement and hurting our future. That must be stopped. In summary, I'm done and I'm on time. This is like a first. I'm done and I'm on time. 16 years and counting. 16 years and counting. Who is in Iowa? Who is at Des Moines? You remember when I got up and I said we can normalize atheism in 20 years? Well, I mean it. I mean it, 16 years and counting. And look at what we've achieved. Look at the growth that we've achieved only in the last four years. Look at the explosion that we've seen only in the last four years. Folks, I might have been too conservative in my 20-year estimate. We might get there earlier. We, if we continue this pace, and we do not concede to religion's veracity, ubiquity, and privilege. And if we work as a movement, not as an organization, not as individuals, not with personal agendas, but as a coordinated movement, we can get this done fast and soon. If you can hear my voice, there's a real good chance that we could reach atheist normalcy in your lifetime in your lifetime. And I am so privileged and so honored to be the president of American Atheists during this period of time. We are the first and the leaders over and over again. The first here, the first there, the first everywhere. We're doing that because we are the firebrands. We are the firebrands, and that means we do things first. We take it on the hit. From the billboards to CPAC, from the public square to Fox News, we pave the way, even if the road is difficult, because the road is difficult. Somebody has to take the difficult road. Somebody has to take it on the chin. Somebody has to pave the way. Somebody has to stand in front of the, 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 the CPAC crowd with an atheist brochure for the first time. So the next people who do it won't have the shock factor. It'll be easier for them because we did it first. Yes. It means we take it on the chin. Yes, it means we get a lot of hate and a few death threats, and it kind of sucks. But in the end, we wouldn't have this any other way. This is why American Atheist is here. This is what American Atheist is doing. And with your support and with your help, we will not stop until the job is done. Thank you.
so much. Thank you so much.